Hello and welcome to the Seren Stay at Home series archive. This video features an illustrated talk with TJ Hughes on Wales's best 100 churches. We hope you enjoy watching it back. Um, how long ago is it since we published this book? 2006, which means that 14 years ago, um, that summer of 2006, I was dashing around mid Wales photographing churches. <laughs> And uh, that's one of the pleasures, actually, of of, um, of of working in publishing. Is sometimes you get you can get really involved in a book, and because uh, Tim's uh, text was so um, so beautifully written, there was no uh, work to be done on the editing front. So I thought I'd go and take some photographs instead, and it was great fun. And I, uh, through that, I became familiar with quite a lot of the churches in the book, uh, which I'm sure Tim's going to uh, talk about now. And um, rather than hear me talk about the churches, let's hear Tim talk about them instead. Tim, over to you. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Mick. That's very kind of you. Uh, and it's wonderful to have this opportunity to, to see you all and to enthuse about one of my favourite subjects in the world, the old Welsh churches. The old churches can truly touch the heart and the mind. I'm sure you've all felt this too. And uh, when you visit them, you have this great sense of stepping into the past, stepping into the footsteps of our ancestors. They are the most extraordinary doorway into Wales's ancient history and culture. And you so often feel to an atmosphere in these places, a numinous sense of place, which can be quite transporting. And now I have to do the technical challenge of sharing a screen. So let's hope I can manage that. Great. I'm going to make it a little bit larger. I hope you can all see uh, the pictures. Well, looking at this one, I think you can see how they keep their secrets rather. They are the most undemonstrative of places. You just, just to think about their sheer difference uh, let's spend a moment thinking about the archetypal English parish church. It stands proudly on the main street of village or town, and so often with a tall medieval spire acting as a landmark for miles around. Well, in Wales, no medieval spire. In fact, if, if we were to travel the length and breadth of the country together, visiting all our 7,000 or so places of worship, when we finally collapsed in a heap at the end of that journey, we would have been able to count all the tall medieval spires on the fingers of one hand. And that just emphasizes that those belong to quite a different place and culture. Not only no spire, but usually no tower either. Most often there's just a simple belfry, sometimes with the bell rope hanging loosely down, getting blown around in the wind. And as you see, no village street. In fact, absolutely no sign of any village at all. Medieval Wales was still in an Iron Age pattern, pattern of settlement uh, with solitary farmsteads, no clusters of community at all. And the placing of the churches took their place in that kind of a map. And it's still true. In the old counties of Anismon, Brecon, Carnarvon, Pembroke, even now more than half of our medieval parish churches are solitary places quite apart from the nearest settlement. Here's another one. It stands up on its mountain. It's a good 15 minutes walk from the nearest road. And yet for such a lonely place, it has the most astonishing sense of community one which has been literally engraved into the stones of the churchyard. And when you walk in that churchyard, you get to know the community that lived there over centuries because they've all been memorialized in original Welsh poetry, written for them by men who were with their bodies, local farm laborers, but in their minds and in the minds of their community, they were poets. So the churchyard at Cangiu is an original 
book of Welsh verse. And of course, we're touching here something else which the journey around the churches reveals to us so clearly, that rich Gwerin culture, the folk culture of Wales, which was so famously admired by travellers from other countries. George Borrow, for example, said he was simply astonished to find how cultured the, the most humble people were as he travelled. Everybody could recite poetry, could play the harp, whatever it was. And yet, it's not that culture and that sense of community that you notice first when you're standing up on that mountain. It's the astonishing sense of a place in the landscape. Looking east from there, you see the snow-capped mountains of Snowdonia, north to the great Iron Age hill village of Tricayri, west to Garn Vadrin and the edges of Penflyn, and south, the land falls away beneath you here to the sacred islands of St. Tidwell in the blue sea below you. And you just know that some ancient Welsh saint placed his church precisely here to acknowledge and praise the God of creation. And this is such a truth about Welsh churches. They are not about what man could create. They are about marking what God has created. Uh, I can assure you that when you're standing up there, you don't say to yourself, well, I wish there was a bit more architecture up here. And so, Welsh churches are perhaps above all churches in a landscape. That's the, that's the most recurring theme. And if you think about Welsh place names, they are more than anywhere else in the world that I have discovered, religion and landscape conjoined. If you think about our place names, Llanaba, the church at the river mouth, Llanreada, the church by the waterfall, Llan Anis, the island church, which might be just an island between two dreams up in the hills. Llan Gum, the valley church. Llan Vynydd, the mountain church. Llan Rig, the church in the heather. Llan Delo Graban, Tylo's church among the corn marigolds. All these wonderful names that we have. And this is another one. Uh, the church in the Alder Grove is how we would perhaps romantically translate it, but Welsh can be a pretty blunt, plain speaking language too, of course. And the way to translate it in that mode would be the church in the bog. And it, this one absolutely is. If you visit in the wetter months, you might have to ooze and squelch your way across the churchyard. And sometimes the water rises up through the nave floor uh, and in fact, all the pews in it are raised on wooden platforms to keep the congregation's feet out of the, the mire. When I was researching, I found a, a letter from the local community there to their bishop, written in about 1840, something like that. And it said in so many words, please, when we die, don't lower us into that liquid mud of our churchyard. Please move the church somewhere high and dry. But clearly, tradition had the last word because there it still is. So in Wales, we have churches in bogs, we have churches in sand dunes, we have churches over the sources of rivers. We have churches even halfway down the cleft in a cliff. If you were, if you were sailing along past Bullslaughter Bay on the southern coast, <clears throat> It, the great banks of high limestone cliffs and suddenly there's a point where the cliffs seem to magically part and there's a stone stairway leading up from sea to cliff top and halfway up is this extraordinary church, St. Govan's. And I think what we're seeing here is this sense of the ancient Celtic people, the ancient Welsh people, again wanting to mark and honour particular points in the landscape that they had recognized with worship. And this is not on just any stretch of coastline, it's the southernmost point on that whole stretch of Pembrokeshire coastline, just exactly as St. David's and its tributary chapels are marking the westernmost point of that whole stretch of coastline. There's a church uh, up on the northwest coast on a tidal island. 
And there's probably no more raised land that any church is on than this one. I hope you can see those steep steps leading up there from the, the damp uh, seabed. And this church became a mesmerizing theme in the last 50 years or so for our, probably our greatest painter of those years, Cuffin Williams. And sometimes he painted it dark against the backdrop of the coast, sometimes lit by the whites and greys of a winter storm, and sometimes with the waves crashing over that roof and through that open belfry, from which no doubt the bell was long ago blown away. And I find this fascinating that what our culture used to mark an honour with worship, these days it marks an and marks and honours with art, which perhaps is just another expression of the same kind of impulse. There are places that you visit where the church seems still a part of the mountain out of which it has so clearly been built, just another carn on the mountain like the one behind it. And we can see that again way down south at Komyoi, where the church is so clearly built out of the stone of that old red sandstone mound that looms behind it. Here's a close-up of it. You can see, too, that this is Wales' own leaning tower. In fact, entirely leaning church, the whole building is at sixes and sevens. It's a church that's are not all leaning in the same direction, by the way. A church that's definitely drunk too much communion wine. Uh, and in fact, I often think about the parishioners going to take their communion wine up at the altar and when they rise and turn to go back to their pew the chancel is veering downwards and sideways in front of them very steeply and they must really get a sense of well that was that was powerful stuff that I just took. There's a lovely local joke there uh, which is uh, go to Komyoi if you feel inclined. Not so very far from there is this lovely church of Thanelu in the Black Mountains. To reach it, you have to wander down a winding lane that seems to go deeper into the landscape as you head east. And you come to a point where the lane seems to stop. It changes sharply in, in direction. And you're at a, at a steep bank uh, with a tall hedgerow of trees on the top of it. There's just a little gap in the hedgerow. You go up some steps and through the gap, and you're into an expansive plan. And the, on the further side of it is this huddle of almost windowless walls, 700-year-old walls, which are this church. And it has 1,400-year-old Celtic crosses by the door. And when you push open that door and you go down some steps into the interior, you turn and you see this extraordinary survival of a 14th century rood screen, half survival, all the lower part has gone. And I hope you can see these quatrefoil openings through which the watchers in the loft would have looked down at the secret ceremonies at the altar. And this ghost mark of the cross, which would have hung there in the Middle Ages. Uh, against a backdrop which, when I wrote my book all those years ago, I described as blood red, thinking that I was being metaphorical. Uh, but in fact, since then, the, the conservation people have been in and done their analysis, and they found that back in the Middle Ages, these loft panels were literally and liberally drenched in ox blood. Can you imagine a more graphic and emotionally intense backdrop to the image of the crucified Christ looming over you as, an, as a 14th century soul in the parish than a, a, than a wall of blood. So when you're standing in Fenelieu, you feel enveloped by the landscape and the ancient holiness of the place. I think of it as a kind of Arcadia of ghosts. Uh, and yet one of the surprises there is that when you look at the stones in the churchyard, uh, one of the families who have the most graves there are the Aubreys. Now, the first Aubrey in those parts was a Norman knight, 
who came riding out of Herefordshire one day with some of his mates, determined to take a little piece of Wales for themselves. And they succeeded. They successfully killed the local lord, Bevanat Maynach, and divided up his territory between them. And the evidence of this and a number of surrounding churchyards is that the Aubreys lived very well for centuries from that single act of murder. But yet what you feel standing there is that it was the ancient Welsh culture that absorbed and overwhelmed those Normans and not the other way around. The churches give you a rewriting of the history in that way. But the picture is quite different uh, a few miles up the road at Brecon. These are a couple of Aubreys too. And this is, um, to the best of my own exploring, uh, the oldest surviving husband and wife tomb in Wales. It dates from 1312. And it, it's very charming, I think, and unusual, because these two Aubreys chose to be depicted uh, in such a mood of piety, whereas, of course, the more typical medieval tomb is to have the man in the latest armour and the lady in the latest high fashion. But they have uh, an image of the crucified Christ between them on their shared pillow, and he has another one, which he's holding between his praying hands. And these two Aubreys are in surroundings which recognize their family roots exactly, surroundings which are entirely French of Brecon Cathedral. It was, it was not a cathedral in the Middle Ages, it was a monastery, but a cathedral now. And uh, the east end of Brecon Cathedral is built uh, in the early English style of architecture. And uh, one of the finest examples of that in Wales, the first phase of Gothic. Early English is a total misnomer. The style is entirely French and was imported from France. And no surprise that this French speaking aristocracy, which were edging their way into Wales and to conquering and possessing more of it, would be building in their own style, in the, in the pieces of land that they had taken. So there, between just those two churches, you have actually the two major themes of our medieval built heritage of churches. On the one hand, you have the simple Celtic shrine box surrounded by a circular fan and often streams, and sometimes with the uniquely Welsh feature of a circle of yew trees. So you have circles within circles, uh, and always a very simple building. And on the other hand, you have the French tradition, which evolved through the well-known sequence of styles from Romanesque to Early English to Decorated to Perpendicular, and which had always an instinct to grandeur. So we had two very contrary traditions butting up against each other in the country. And of course, it's not as though those two traditions didn't influence each other over the centuries that they had to share the country and fight for the country against each other. Of course they did. And it's the churches that show the story of how the two cultures intermingled and met in the middle quite a surprising number of times. Just exactly as our Welsh medieval literature, literature shows the same story. If you think about the Mabinogion tales, they are that mixture of Celtic magic and French romance. And that's what makes them so rich and such a important part of the wider European literary heritage. There's a th there, there are two more main strands of this tradition of church building, church and chapel building. And the third strand are the chapels. And this comes in from the 17th century when the first chapels were created initially, like this one at Myceronin near Glazebury on the Wye, by just being a converted barn. And in fact, they still record the names of all the ministers. Uh, uh, all their names since 1645 are on the pulpit there. And we're looking here at perhaps the, the closest we can come now to uh, an early chapel interior. Uh, 
most of the furniture you're looking at is 300 years old. And this chapel had its moment of fame, its literary fame, 40 years ago when it featured in Bruce Chatwin's hugely successful novel, On the Black Hill. Uh, in that novel, there is a chapel called Mysa Valian, which is a terribly thinly disguised Mysa Ronin. And uh, he talks about the parishioners in Mysa Valian, uh, taking their communion around a central plank table as though this was the upper room and the Last Supper itself. Uh, and of course, Chatwin, we know now as a kind of modern pilgrim to the spirit of place. And he chased it down in Patagonia and Australia and widely across the world. So I find it particularly interesting that what he responded to in this little corner of the, the Black Mountains and the, the Wye Valley in Wales was not the landscape and the setting, but the interior. And I think that Chapman put his finger on another truth about the Welsh aesthetic, that, in, that interiors with their communal closely gathered nature are at the heart and center of Welsh culture. They matter in a way that exteriors simply never do. And our buildings absolutely show that. And of course, you might argue that, well, the stone in Wales so ancient, it's just too tough to carve, or the weather is so weathering that you wouldn't bother. But I think that it's something much deeper in the culture. The fourth strand, well, it will not surprise you to hear, of course, is the immense, immense contribution of Victorian art and architecture. So many of our chapels and quite a number of our churches too. And I wanted particularly to show you this image from a church called San Vaikil Gedin. It's a church which is filled with huge murals. It's a wonderful sight when you go in. And this image is particularly special for me because it, it plays to a number of the themes that, uh, that I've been talking about already. Those of you that know that patch will recognize those very distinctive outlines of the three local mountains, Bloringe, with wonderful names to Bloringe, Skirid, and Sugarloaf, and this fantastic evocation of nature with these blustering cumulus clouds and the slanting rain, and the river Usk flowing beneath it all, just as it does at the edges of the churchyard right outside. This by an artist called Hayward Sumner, an important artist, a pioneer of the arts and crafts movement. He was one of the exhibitors in the very first exhibition of the Arts and Crafts Society. His work went on to influence and to be part of the very first Art Nouveau buildings in Brussels, the work of Victor Horta, uh, a very, very influential artist. And he knew this patch of Wales because his grandfather lived in this village. And he had clearly absorbed what the, the local religious buildings represented. And he gathered together, as you see in this image, um, a marking and honoring of the local landscape and marking it in art and marking it in praise. Uh, you can just see below, I hope, O ye mountains and hills, bless ye the Lord, and bringing that into the interior. Well, I want to linger just for a little bit more in the valleys of the Wye and the Usk because they are really so rich in treasures and, of course, gorgeous landscape too. If we were to go right to the mouth of the Usk at Newport, we would see at St. Wallace there this wonderful survival of perhaps the very earliest pieces of French art in Wales. The closest image to this it's of a man praying, by the way, with raised hands, um, a way of praying which has come back around <laughs> now, but this dates from 1100. And the closest image to this is in a church uh, in Dijon in Burgundy, where we think probably the carver was based in Dijon, he was commissioned, and this capital must have traveled by barge up the rivers and then across the sea and around to Newport. <laughs> 
It's at the entrance to the nave. And on the other side of the entrance is this perhaps even more extraordinary image. I, I often think when I look at this, well, really this could be a 20th century design, couldn't it? It could be by Picasso or Miro or Paul Clay, with this strange vertical floating fish and this lovely fluttering bird pecking at a very large berry there. Well, it's not 20th century. Again, it's 900 year old French art in Newport. And close to the mouth of the Y, we would see French things too. This, of course, is Tintern, one of the most famous, most visited sites in Wales. A very beautiful place to be. So much I could say about it, but just a couple of observations I want to make. The first is to ask you to notice its sheer verticality, its heaven pointed height, the way that those great Gothic arches and those steep gables and every window too, uh, is like a great sheaf of upward streaming arrows. It aspires and it lifts the eyes. In that, it is terribly French. And the timing of buildings is often so interesting. This is, I think, the apogee of French architecture in Wales, even as a ruin, a complete ruin. And when was it built? Well, it was built exactly in the years immediately after the completion of the long, long conquest of Wales, over more than 200 years by that French speaking aristocracy. So this is a, a triumphant statement. It's a, it's a statement of those French lords saying, look who has the master culture now. And of course, the second thing to say about Tintin, and I can't leave it without mentioning Wordsworth's great poem written nearby after a visit to the Abbey in 1798. One of the most famous poems, of course, in the whole of English literature. And a poem often regarded as representing the great romantic breakthrough, the great romantic appreciation of our landscape, and even of what it might mean to be human uh, amongst such landscapes. Wordsworth wrote, uh, of course, that that's being in such a place, just being there could be restorative to blood and heart and mind. While with an eye made quiet by the power of harmony and the deep power of joy, we see into the life of things. Well, of course, it's, <laughs> it's justly famous. It's wonderful. But yet, is it, doesn't it just seem to echo what those ancient Welsh saints were marking and honouring more than a thousand years earlier. In the long stream of the centuries, is Wordsworth's poem just one more epiphany in the physical and spiritual impact of the Welsh landscape on the human mind? Now, a little bit further upriver, uh, at Abergavenny, we have one of a small number of churches which, which, which form a, a group spread around the country, which are a, like almost a collection, a national museum of sculpture. And Abergavenny is perhaps the finest gathering of medieval sculpture that survives in Wales. I just wanted to show you a couple of images and to introduce to you this lovely couple. Here we've got Gladys and William. And Gladys is pure Agincourt glamour. She is the daughter of David Gam, who is the Davy Gam of Shakespeare's Henry V. And David was killed on the battlefield, protecting Henry. And in fact, this was such an important moment to Henry that when the battle was all over, hours later, he went in search of David, and he, he found poor David still dying, and he knighted him then and there on the battlefield. So Gladys represents all this, and 
uh, I think the evidence of her tomb is that she must have been showered in riches by a grateful king on his return. She is literally dripping in jewellery um, on almost every finger of her hands here and this extraordinary jewel encrusted necklace here. I hope you can just about make out. And indeed every single intersection of this great uh, headdress that she's wearing is a great clustering of jewellery. She was known as the Star of Gaveni. And I think if you imagine her riding out of her castle up on the hill on a Sunday morning down into the valley to go to church, she must have been glistening in the sunlight like, some, like a starry heaven indeed. And, and Gladys went on to be uh, an ancestor of the great Welsh poet George Herbert, an ancestor too of the two Herbert brothers who were the, the dedicatees and presumably therefore the funders of the first folio of Shakespeare, without which, of course, we wouldn't have half the plays. So her contribution to the arts is, is extraordinary. And uh, there's another lovely thing to mention about her too, which is that she was a descendant of that same Blethyn at Meinach who had been murdered by Aubrey 300 or so years earlier. So in a, in a, in a way, a kind of justice was finally done when she became the lady of the manor. The, the other amazing sculpture there, of, of many actually, uh, is this extraordinary image of Jesse, the father of David in the Old Testament. And this is the only, the only surviving giant oak icon uh, in the whole of Britain from the Middle Ages. There must have been many such things at the Eastern altars before the Reformation and all the destruction of them that happened then. And this is just the very base of it. It was a complete Jesse tree showing all his descendants. But just this is 10 feet long. And it's a very impressive sculpture. It has an extraordinary monumentality, more so than you usually get with things made in the Gothic era, it's late 15th century. And it mixes that with this restless sense of movement. And of course, people, art historians normally associate monumentality and restless movement with the Baroque, which was a hundred years later again. But here this is from probably 1480s or 90s. And yet mixed also with wonderful sensitivity. Jesse has a, a, a extraordinary expression on his face as though he's seen everything in life and is totally unimpressed by it. And then it's all the little details of every hair on the, this huge beard, these lovely sensitive fingers of the left hand, and even a little thin belt, meant to be a leather belt, I suppose, around his waist. And one of the thrills has been that uh, since I wrote my book, art historians have become more and more excited about this sculpture and regarding it now as one of Britain's greatest medieval artistic treasures. Part, by the way, of a, a real flowering of wood carving in the late 15th century in Wales. You can see a, another example of that. Just want to show you this little detail from it, this lovely Welsh dragon with a very curly tail. And he's munching his way on a, a very Welsh sessile oak tree there. Um, up in uh, a mountain church, steeply up from Abergavenny, um, which many people regard as the definitive Welsh mountain church. It has that combination of Celtic streams and Catholic shrines and then Protestant plastering with the word uh, that seems to illuminate the sequence of religious history in Wales. And this is on the rood screen in the church there. It's one of a dozen or so of the very best rood screens that survived from that time in the country. Welsh style. We also have some great surviving English style rood screens in Wales and the two differ in exactly the way that the, the two styles of building differ in that the English rood screens have vaulted architecture just as the buildings do, the Welsh ones don't. And this has often been compared to uh, 
the same impulse that's seen in the poetry of the time. If you look at these winding, intersecting lines within the, the frameworks of a rude screen, it's exactly the same as in the, the poems with winding, intersecting lines within the rigid structures of the strict bardic rules. And uh, that great era of Kawadai and Kanhanev, of course. And again, the timing is so fascinating. Why should there be this triumphant moment of Welsh art and Welsh design in the late 15th century? Well, of course, perhaps the most extraordinary moment in Welsh history had happened after more than 200 years of exclusions after the conquest. Welsh Henry Tudor had just gone and captured the English crown and was ruling the whole of England and Wales. And it's not surprising, of course, that he had to reward the Welsh armies that had helped him to win that crown. And money was evidently streaming back into Wales. And, and that's reflected in an immense number of rebuildings of churches and new uh, special fittings for the interiors. So the impact of the, uh, that Tudor moment um, is something that the churches act as extraordinary witness to. And it's, of course, the Welsh had consoled themselves through this long period of loss by saying that their ancient king, King Arthur, would one day reawaken and reconquer the island of Britain. And Henry, we, we sort of forget it now because we think of Henry Tudor being followed by Henry VIII. Um, but Henry's eldest son was specifically and clearly it was part, of, part of this whole message, was named Arthur. We would have had a Welsh King Arthur back on the throne of England and Wales if things had gone to plan and poor Arthur hadn't uh, died as a teenager. Well, um, just a last little phase. I can't, uh, I can't uh, leave this without spending a little bit of time up in the northeast, which is my own patch, my own Mythia Square. Uh, and in fact, in, on the, uh, near the border um, in the northeast, what you see quite a bit is uh, English tradition and English design. And that's because there were parts of what are now northeast Wales that even in the Dark Ages, long before the Norman conquest, um, were parts of Mercia, were parts of, governed by an English king and were settled by English settlers. So you had some English village names, including at this village on the Dee. And so even when uh, they were rebuilding in Georgian times, you can see what an English influence, Christopher Wren influenced this lovely church has. It was built by a man who was best known as the local champion wrestler. Uh, and I, I wonder maybe if that's how he won the commission. Um, but what a lovely sensitive job he made of it with these round headed windows and doorway and up in the tower there, echoing each other and the circle of the apse. And again, another echo between the balustrade on the tower and uh, the apse. Uh, it was built from a legacy. The donor left 900 pounds for a new church. This is in 1728. And a thousand pounds for his own funeral party, which must have been a fantastic send off. And, and English things would strike the visitor again at Harden, high above the estuary of the Dee. This was Gladstone's church. Gladstone, of course, uh, the, the still the only man to have been Prime Minister of England for four times, four different times. And Gladstone was a great friend of the artist Edward Byrne Jones. But Byrne Jones was also particularly close to his daughter Mary, uh, who he did a most beautiful drawing of. And he gave Mary those melancholy eyes and that wistful look that uh, Byrne Jones liked to give to all the young women that he drew or painted. The result of this friendship is that there are seven Byrne Jones windows. And this church meant so much to Gladstone. He, he had married a local girl, Catherine Glynn, and he lived there and he worshipped in this church every single morning when, uh, when he wasn't down in London exercising the highest offices of state. But the greatest of the windows there is this one, 
and it's Burne Jones's last work in stained glass. And when he made it, he was feeling older than his years. He was battered by the death of his lifelong friend, William Morris, which he said had left him quite, quite alone. And I think you can feel the sadness in this nativity, which of course is usually a happy scene, but uh, the angels here have turned their backs on us. The watchers at the scene are looking inward. There's no characteristic Burne Jones cool maiden looking out at us. Even the face of the child is hidden from us. So when you're standing in hardened naves, there's a west window, and so in the afternoon, early evening, when the sun is shining through this, the whole church is glowing, and you feel that you're gazing up at some distant, untouchable dream. It's a wonderful, wonderful experience. Uh, and yet, for such a, a sad depiction, such gorgeous colours with these deep shepherd greens and what I think we can call Tiffany blues, but well before Tiffany, of course. And up here, if you look at the stable roof and uh, the sky, some really almost abstract panes, uh, like something that John Piper would be putting into churches 50 years later. It shows how forward-looking Burne Jones was, something which I think has been forgotten now, but which was very much understood about him uh, in his lifetime. And this beautiful and moving image is a, an introduction to the fact that the Northeast is the land of images. For some reason, it may just be historical accident, or the greatest survivals of medieval stained glass in Wales are between the valleys of the Conwy and the Dee. And the greatest single wall of images, dozens and dozens of individual images, is at the church at Gresford. And many of them are dedicated to the story of the life of Mary. And I just wanted to show you this one simple example, this lovely depiction of Mary's parents exchanging the kiss, which was said to represent the moment of her conception. It's a kind of annunciation moment for Mary. And perhaps the greatest surviving image of all, and again, this is just a small fraction of it, is another Jesse tree like they had at Abergavenny. There's Jesse again at the base of it. Um, I, I just wanted to particularly, this is in the Vale of Clue, sorry, I should say, in uh, Van Rijeda. Um, I wanted particularly to show you this lovely depiction of King David, depicted as a Welsh bard with a, with a, with a, a very Welsh harp, a totally unique design, of course, in his hand, as though the Psalms were written on a Welsh harp, lovely thought. And in quite, quite the dandyish, dandyish costume for 1533, the date when this window was made. Um, similar era to the windows at King's College Chapel, Cambridge, and ranked by art historians as in the same league. You'd see a, a touch of the local again at this uh, crucifixion window in Kilken in Flintshire, where if you just uh, double take for a moment, Golgotha looks exactly like the green Cluidian hills that flow down to the edges of the churchyard right outside. It's exactly as we saw at Flanvaya Kilgedin. Uh, and of course, this is 400 years earlier than that image at Flanvaya Kilgedin. So you can see the continuity of that artistic tradition of acknowledging the local landscape. There's a chapel at Rieg on the Dee, which is perhaps the most extraordinary of the painted interiors of Wales. So much of it is painted and carved. It's an extraordinary, colourful sight. And yet it's a chapel with a very serious message. It's a chapel that wants you to know that life is short, that we haven't got long, and we better get our act together. And yet I don't think anywhere ever has that message been delivered with such sheer vivacity and uh, joie de vivre as it has at Reed. My favourite of the murals there is this lovely one. I think you can, you can see 
that it's giving you that the serious news that the flame of your life is burning down, that the sand is running through your hourglass. Uh, it even goes as far as to say, well, you may be feeling fine now, but uh, this little message here is telling us that, that everybody strong is weak in the end. And yet, just look at that reef around the skull. It's literally it's bursting into flower, every inch of it, as if it just can't help itself. It's a very reed reef. And look, at, I think we can probably agree this must be the most comfortable skeleton in Wales. Look at him leaning back there, and he, he's even, he's turned what's meant to be a threatening rope into a lovely, comfortable pillow. And he's got his knees up and he's, he's clearly smiling. Uh, uh, the boundaries of life and death are loose at Rig. And we can see the same thing a few miles down river at Llangothlin, which has for me the most extraordinary roof in Wales. Uh, and it, it was made in the same years as Michelangelo was painting the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. So I relished describing this as Wales' own Sistine ceiling. And in terms of what it depicts, it could not be more different than Michelangelo, Michelangelo, who's so serious. This could not be more irreverent. Up there, they have the Virgin Mary has to keep company with pagan green men. And there are angels alongside drunkards, uh, not just drinking from huge beer tankards, but even climbing into the beer barrels to get the last drop. And they're all surrounded in this restless Celtic flowering and recreation in the interior of the world of nature outside. It's the secular and the sacred. It's the earthly and the heavenly, all meshed up together in a wonderful Welsh mix. And of course, this is how it comes out in the architecture. In Wales, there was no architectural distinction. Why would there be between the Holy East and the secular West Ends of the church? There's no differentiated chancels. There's no complication of aisles and transepts. There's just one shared space for everybody, man, woman, and God. The simple rectangular plan has been the Welsh choice of preference all the way from the earliest saint shrines to the last of the grand chapels. And there is something else. These old churches have a way of lying low on the land. In fact, this one at Flangar on the D, I often think it's not so much lying on the land as trying to burrow into it. And every time I go back, it seems like the earth has climbed higher up the wall of the porch. And here it is now, nearly reaching the base of the east window. In Wales, there is a sense of the importance of linking to the land. In Wales, holiness is down here. It's not up there as at French Tintern. Verticality, a surging upward, has been the impulse of church buildings right across Europe, if you travel from England all the way to Russia. But in Wales, it is just not so. In Wales, we have a kind of apotheosis of the horizontal, where our churches hug the ground. And wouldn't this be true for a country in which, through all the long pre-Christian centuries, the sacred presences, the Holy Spirits, the gods, we're in the rivers, the earth, the stones, the trees. And truly, that's been true through most of the Christian era too. Uh, the visiting of holy wells, the holiness of rivers, the holiness of stones has been absolutely part of our tradition and culture. And this, that this is reflected in our built heritage should come as no surprise at all to those of you who know your Welsh literature. If you think about David Ap Gwilym, 
in the 14th century, our greatest medieval poet, who wrote that the wild birds are singing mass in the foliage. Just think of all of David's wonderful evocations of the months of the year, the seasons, the thrushes, the holly grove. They're all praise songs. And then our great 20th century poets, R.S. Thomas, who wrote that the landscape itself feels like a church, that the air crumbled and broke on him as generously as bread. Or Gwyneth, who wrote that angels are walking here, their footprints are on our roadways. Or, or Dylan, even Dylan, in that marvellous late poem, In Country Sleep, who wrote that he had found the Holy of Holies just nearby in the local wood. Or, or our poet painter, David Jones, who wrote that the land is nothing less than the sleeping Lord. Uh, or the writer Alice Thomas Ellis from Penmain Maur, who, who summed it up beautifully for me when she wrote that the Welsh countryside has a unique and magical quality, and in some aspects is not easily to be distinguished from heaven. The old churches hug the ground because they know this. There was no need in Wales for vaulting arches or tall spires to lead the eye to some other heaven up above. So in closing now, these are the eyes with which we should see our lovely vernacular, severely simple, perfectly plain churches. Just look at that one. I mean, it, it could be a granary, it could be a barn, it could be a farmhouse, but it's a church. And when we built our first chapels, we built them in exactly the same way. They are long houses of the soul, long houses of the spirit. They share exactly the same feeling about what a place of worship should be. And they often share the same sorts of locations. Really, this little one could have been placed there by any ancient Welsh saint in that dip in the hills. But in fact, in this case, it was Welsh Quakers in 1700. And there it is close up. It's uh, a house of God, isn't it, in the most domestic sense. The buildings are simple and they're beautiful. They have a message, I think, of human scale, of integrated communal, almost domestic interiors. They are down to earth, close to the land, honoring the landscape. In their dimensions and demeanor, they value people, not just in relation to each other, but in bringing them closer to their God. Messages surely more important than architecture. And in fact, as buildings that express those messages, they are perfect for their purpose, which perhaps is what architecture should really be about. Well, I think I'd better stop there. I've probably gone on too long. I could go on a lot longer, I apologise, but I'd better stop there. Thank you very much indeed. Jochen Bauer Young. Thank you so much, Tim. That was a wonderful talk. I, th I think everyone will agree. Um, I don't, um, I think we, if anyone had a question, maybe we've got time to maybe take one or two, if anyone did want to take any, um, you can unmute uh, yourself. So if you've got a question, we can maybe take one or two, if that's all right with you, Tim. Yes, of course. Love, I love questions. Thank you. If anyone has one. No pressure. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, oh, great. Uh, can, uh, can you hear me? Yes. I can. That's good. I was thinking of uh, Pevsner's Reef Lecture series, The Englishness of English Art, in which he makes the point, I know, that English church architecture has a horizontal element that the French don't have, and he always uses Lincoln Cathedral as a wonderful example of combining horizontal and vertical. So there is another element you can add to your story, isn't there? Well, that's so, it's so true, but yet, you know, the, the difference in emphasis is still so extreme. I mean, if I, if I showed you examples of exteriors of 15th century churches in Wales, um, even a church with immense resources and money, like Clinog Bower in Carnarvonshire, uh, 
and then I compared it to a 15th century grand church in the Cotswolds or in East Anglia, I could show you that the, 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 the verticality of the patterning on English steeples and the fact that there's a clear story in every English church of that style. And in Wales, there just isn't. In Wales, you get this extraordinary emphasis of the horizontal. Um, but what you say is fascinating. And of course, one of the things that from the Welsh perspective, you could absolutely argue is that English culture is absolutely a merger of English and Celtic cultures because, because the Celtic people who lived across the whole island of Britain survived in great numbers into the English culture and influenced it. So you could absolutely make the case that it is a, a kind of halfway house or a bridge between the French culture, very vertical, the English culture, a bit of both, the Welsh culture horizontal. <laughs> so I think that that's a good picture to have actually and that's why I was really emphasizing um, the contrast between French and English, uh, sorry French and Welsh, because we didn't have English lords in Wales in the Middle Ages for very long. It's such a fascinating thing that the French conquest lords would marry into the families of the Welsh lords and vice versa of course Neither of them would marry the English, <laughs> who didn't have any land <laughs> and who'd been conquered. So that, that's a very interesting part of the story. But thank you, it's a great question. I think um, maybe Michael Club, I saw him wave at me. I think maybe. Yeah, just, uh, just a quick one. And uh, I enjoyed uh, the book so much. Uh, uh, the, the photographs are, be uh, are stunningly beautiful. The argument is wonderful, and the prose is uh, so liquid. Uh, when's uh, the next one coming out with the next hundred bad questions? <laughs> well, I think we, you know, there, were, there were conversations about the possibility at one time of uh, uh, Wales' second best hundred. <laughs> it didn't seem to have quite the same ring to it. And, and you know, frankly, um, I'd, I'd said the main things that I wanted to try and say, I suppose. Yes, I can no. understand that. I can understand that in the argument, certainly. Yes, it's very beautifully expressed. But it's just a disappointment there's so many other lovely, lovely churches. But there we are. Fine. <laughs> you're, you're so, it, it's that's so right. And so many of you have neglected. And of course, I, have, of course, have always felt the guiltiest person in the country about all the ones that I left out and couldn't include. <laughs> but but I, I have to give huge compliments to Mick here because to go for, for a, a house that was really mainly publishing poetry, to dare to, to publish as many as a hundred churches with photographs was a, was a, a real risk that Mick took uh, and um, um, it's only really <laughs> great. <laughs> um, I, can see, I can see, by the way, Matthew, Matthew Wood here, which is a great thrill to see you. Um, well, you just, actually, you, <laughs> your screen's just gone black. But, but Matthew is, is a wonderful, wonderful painter and has been painting the interiors of Welsh churches over the past few years fantastically well. So I do recommend Matthew's website to go and look at more representations in art of uh, Welsh churches. Great, thank you so much. Mick, did you have anything you wanted to say to round off? Well, only really to thank everyone for, for coming and listening and to thank Tim uh, for taking us on um, such a journey and, uh, and explaining his, um, his uh, thesis so clearly, it, it, it continues to fascinate me. Uh, as I said, it's been a, it's been a great journey. Uh, it included only a few, really, of the 100 churches. And if you don't have the book, I really would urge you to buy it. Um, not because I published it, but because it really is a fine, fine book. As Simon uh, Jenkins said, a really wonderful book. If Simon says that, then who are we to disagree with him? Um, so thank you very much. And um, it's been great to see you all. I hope you've all enjoyed it. And um, we wish you well uh, as, as we go into the future, into the, um, into the desperate future.